Take your Bible and let's turn to the book of Revelation where we are studying. We are in Revelation chapter 21 this morning. And we've been in that chapter for several Sunday mornings, for several weeks, as if you're a visitor, we've been going now for about a year and a half through the book of Revelation, and we're kind of coming to the conclusion here, and uh, yet these verses in Revelation 21 have been so incredibly important to us, because what they do is they teach us about this aspect of the second coming of Christ that often people don't think about. You know, we, we think a lot about the, the end times and all those, but somehow or another we fall short of thinking forward to what the eternal state will be like. So in Revelation 21 and 22, John records for us what he sees. He tells us what he sees. And there's a couple of things that I think John tells us this for, and I want you to kind of see this as we come back to the chapter this morning. I think John tells us because he wants us to think accurately clearly and, 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 and biblically about life after death for both the non-Christian and the Christian. I mean, you know, the book of Revelation obviously is making this obvious and making this clear to us that there are two people in this world. There are God's people and there are those who are not God's people. There are Christians and there are non-Christians. There are those who have believed savingly upon Christ for salvation, and there are those who care nothing about it, and they've rejected it, and they resisted it. So the book of Revelation, as it kind of winds down here, does remind us over and over again how we should think about life after death for both the Christian and the non-Christian. Because honestly, here's how people tend to think about life and death. You know, we, we live on this earth, we, we have jobs, we have careers, we do all the things that we do, and somehow or another when life ends and we die, we do a service called a funeral or a memorial, and, and then we try to put pieces back together and we just go on. And that's not the biblical view of life for us and life after death. Not even for the non-believer, it shouldn't be that way. I mean, we rightly comfort ourselves, don't we, that when our loved one leaves us, that absent from the body, they are present with the Lord. And that is a great comfort to us. And that's been going on for 2,000 years as the Lord lived and died and buried, rose again, returned to heaven. And every saint who has ever lived and died has now gone to be in the presence of the Lord. And Paul talked about how awesome that was, remember? That absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And he's kind of torn in this life about whether to stay here or really does he want to go on. Stay here and serve and do the things God's called him or go on and be with the Lord in heaven. But often, brothers and sisters, what we tend to do is we tend to stop right there and go, that is the Christian message, that is the gospel, that we come to Christ, we live our lives on this earth, we die, and then we go to be with Jesus. But that's not the end of the story at all. In fact, the book of Revelation wants us to know that it's not the end of the story for the Christian or the non-Christian. When the Christian leaves this world, he is absent from his body and he is present with the Lord. And when an unbeliever leaves this world who doesn't know know Christ, he's not saved, his sins are not forgiven, he is absent from his body as well, but he is separated from the Lord. And if I understand Scripture clearly, he actually is in torment at this point. He knows what it means to be separated from the living God. He knows what it is to have memories, to have pain and all those things. And Revelation has talked about that through this book. And so John says, I want you to see what's coming because I want you to know how you should think of life after death. It's not just die, go to be with the Lord and somewhere float around out there without a body somewhere. The end is he's coming again to establish a new heavens and a new earth. Now listen, brothers and sisters, just like for the unbeliever who is, when he dies, absent from the body and he's separated from the Lord, he is in torment. He is not in the ultimate full fury of that torment yet. When the Lord comes again, and we've seen that in the revelation, it will be the full full-blown judgment that their sin deserves as he opens the books and he judges them according to their deeds. But on the flip side, for the believer, it's not just die, go to be in the Lord in heaven and then just forever be out there somewhere. It's the saints in heaven, as we've seen in the book of Revelation, who are crying out, how long, oh Lord? I mean, when is it all going to end? When, when is the consummation of everything that you promised your people going to be? When are you going to come again? And when are you going to make a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells, where this world that was affected by the fall and sin, when are you going to put it all back together? So Revelation is intended to do this thing for sure, to help us think accurately about life after death. Life after death in the presence of the Lord is not the end of the story. It is, as we're going to see a little more again this morning, it's about this grand plan of God's redemption. 
So John wants us to also think in terms of grasping the greatness of God's redemptive plan. I mean, if sin came into the world at the fall in Genesis 3, after God had created everything that was perfect, Adam and Eve being perfect, creation being perfect, if sin came in at that point, for God to not fully restore and regain everything that sin has affected would not be complete redemption. And so John in this book of Revelation has been helping us grasp and understand the greatness of God's redemptive plan. What I want you to think about is this, as we come again and again to these end chapters here, is that we need to have this cosmic and grand view of God's plan of salvation. We need to see that God is never fully, ultimately satisfied until the entire universe, people and planet and everything in this world he's made, has been purged from all the effects of the fall and of sin. That is when he will be totally satisfied and and the work will be completed and done. And so... That's important for us to grasp in the book of Revelation. Here's a third thing I believe John tells us about these last few chapters, what's coming and what's going on, is so that we will dwell on and long for our future eternal home. He wants us to have this pilgrim mentality, doesn't he? He wants us to really get something of a glimpse of what is coming so that we have this idea and this longing of that day. We're not just looking to get out of this world, to escape this world, but we're looking for this grand redemptive purpose of God where he restores everything in heaven and earth and he creates it all, recreates it all new. He renovates it and he restores it so that we live with him in his world forever and ever eternally. And that is our eternal home and our eternal state. Now, I want you to look as you have your Bible open there in Revelation 21 and going forward, the... The imagery that is used over and over again in this section of chapters 21 and 22 centers around a city, right? We've talked about this city being the city of God, the new Jerusalem, and so forth and so on. Now, I don't know about you, but I want you to think of something. When we think of a city, right, we think of a place that we don't really want to go to, right? (laughs) I mean, when you think of of a city... Pick Atlanta, you know, pick Charlotte, pick Miami, pick wherever you want to go in your life. When you think of a city, you think of a place that's characterized by things like crowdedness. I mean, why do I want to go to a city? A bunch of people there. It's, it's crime infested. It's too busy. It's frustrating. It's a place you just really would like to escape from. And yet in the book of Revelation 21 and 22, the major focus is on a city. It is on a city. It's not like a little chateau out in the country somewhere. It is a city that he keeps describing for us in this passage here. And and as I've said, I think what John is doing here is he's trying to describe to us really what the place of God's dwelling will be like as a city because throughout the scripture we see that the new Jerusalem and the holy city, those described here in Revelation 21 and 22, really point us back to the city of God, Jerusalem, which has been the place where God's presence has dwelt and where geographically his work has taken place. So a city is important in the people of God's mind for sure. And this city, when it comes down, won't be a city like any city we've ever known because it is a new heavens and a new earth. It is a holy city. It's a new Jerusalem. So we do think of cities as places that have a lot of corruption and a lot of crowdiness. It's a frustrating place sometimes. But this city is going to be so unlike it that it will be a city you want to be in, you want to come to, and you want to be a part of. In fact, if you just glance in your chapter 21, just to quickly remind you of this, in the first eight verses, remember we saw that in this city there are no more death, there's no more mourning, there's no more crying, no more pain, there's no more murder, there's no more immoralities, no more liars. Everything that you think of that about a city is not going to be there. And in verses 9 through 21, where we were at last week, we saw that that city is going to have some unique look to it it's going to be filled with the glory of God and it will be refracting and reflecting God's glory all through the jewels that are mentioned there for all eternity you'll just be taken up with the glory of the God who that city belongs to you will see that not only the tribes of the of Israel's names there the apostles are there reminding us of our our redemption that we are the people of God old and new testament we are his people Those walls are confirming that we have security and those gates are pointing to the access that we have to God through Christ and Christ alone. But John's not through telling us about the city. 
He wants us to look at life in the city. Now, we've seen this city that didn't have all those things that we might be used to, like death and crying and suffering and immorality and liars and robbers and all those things. John says those are not there. Now, you've seen in, in the second section of the verses there, this is what the city looks like. Now he wants us to look inside the city. If you look at verse 22, you'll see what I'm talking about. And John says, I saw no temple in it, in the city. I, I went there, I saw it, I, I didn't see any temple in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices an abomination and lying shall ever enter into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a tour through the city. We're going to look at it, and we're going to walk through these verses and find out what the new heavens and the new earth looks like. And here's what I think you should get from these verses, is that this is a place of worship. This is a place of worship. Whatever you might have in your mind about a city, put that one to the side, because John says what I saw was a place that was just beaming with and a constant environment of the worship of God. And I want you to notice this as we go through it. Would you notice there what he says in the verse 22? I saw no temple in it. In this city, the city of God, this new Jerusalem, this holy city that, is, that has come down, the dwelling of God, the place of God. And again, uh, so connected with that at one point you can see this is the bride and this and you can see this is the father's house. It's just interactive and interconnected there. The people of God are there because they are his city in one sense. They are his house and they are his people. But he says when I went there, when I saw this, I saw no temple in it. Now let's just stop there for just a minute and ask ourselves why. If, the, if this is a place of worship, and this is a reminder of worship, why is there no temple there? Now, to get your mind around that, you're going to have to go back to the Old Testament a little bit, and you're going to have to look at this and, and think of this from the standpoint that this is a place of nonstop, now, unhindered worship. That's what verse 22 is going to remind us of, that we are looking at a place, this eternal home, this place when... Jesus returns in the new heavens and the new earth and his people are with him forever and ever. This city of God, this new Jerusalem, in it you won't ever find a temple. And yet it is a place, what's this, of nonstop and unhindered worship. That's the point. Now here's go back to the Old Testament and you'll see what I mean. You remember this from the Old Testament here, this thing called the tabernacle? In the tabernacle, this was a place in the Old Testament for the children of Israel where God set up a physical way for them to be reminded of the presence of God and to come into his presence and to worship him. And you will remember that there were three sections in this thing. You remember you had a courtyard out here in the outside, a courtyard. And then in that little area where there's this tent-like thing, within that are two more sections. There is a place called the holy place, right? And then the holy of holies. And so this was what was set up in the wilderness for the children of Israel. It's how they picked up and they moved around as they were going through the wilderness as a constant reminder that God had placed his presence with his people and he was manifesting himself right in that place called the Holy of Holies. Now, I want you to understand something very carefully. That did not mean that God was confined to that area. God is omnipresent. That means that God is everywhere. God could not in any sense ever confine himself to a tent or a temple or a church building. He just cannot do that because he is God. He is everywhere. It's called his omnipresence. He is everywhere. There is no place that he is not. And so yet, yet he, he gave them this lesson. He gave them this tent so they would begin to think in terms of his presence and what that presence was like. A temple. A tabernacle at one point. Then it had a temple at another point that was created to model and a more sophisticated, obviously more glorious look than the temple had been. And when it was laid out, it had those three places laid out just like that. Now here's a question for you to think about. Why were 
Why were in the temple and in the tabernacle those curtains and walls separating one another? Why were they there for the children of Israel? I mean, why didn't God just say, hey, I'm right here. Y'all come on in and this is where you can worship me at. Why is that? And remember, by the way, that only once a year, once a year, one person, the great, the high priest, had the privilege to go into the most holy place, the holy of holies, to really go on the day of atonement into God's presence. So it wasn't like every day that people got to come in and go right up into the presence of God. One person, one time a year on behalf of everybody. So why these curtains, why these walls in the temple, so to speak, that were blocking off the holy of holies? You want to hear something? This is going to shock you in your American thinking and your culture. It was to protect you. It was to protect them from the fury of the righteous, holy God that he was. It was to remind them that there must be some shield, there must be some buffer from the one that the Old Testament describes him as a consuming fire. (laughs) You know, you just can't run in there and say, hey, how are you doing today, God? Have a great day, how about you? You needed to know that this God is so unlike you that there needs to be barriers and shields between the two of you. And and I want you to know this. Here's kind of the picture I think I get in the Old Testament when I read this. It's like God is saying, draw near, but be careful. Right? Come close, but not that close. That's the picture in the Old Testament. Now, in the New Testament, we don't have a tabernacle. We don't have a temple. We don't have a building that God dwells in. He dwells in us. We, us as Christians, our our lives, our bodies, we are his temple, we are his building, we are his church. That's where he dwells. And yet, we are constantly, aren't we, given things as reminders to remember and help us not forget that we are his people. They had tabernacle, they had temple, we have something else that helps us as a symbol to remind us of that. There are two things, you know them, they're called communion and they're called baptism. Those two symbols are symbols to point us to God and his glorious plan of redemption and the rescue of sinners from the guilt and judgment their sin deserves. And so John, when he looks and he describes this city that is a city of unhindered worship nonstop, because remember the, the doors are open all the time, there's no night, there's no day, it's just nonstop. He is telling us here, there is no temple in this. I saw no temple. There are no symbols. There are no reminders of God's presence. This city is filled with the very one himself who will be worshipped. In other words, God himself is the one who is present and he is the place of worship. He is. So he's telling us, listen, as we think about the coming of Jesus and the new heavens and the new earth, one of the things you need to know, there's never going to be a sanctuary to go to. There's never going to be a temple. There's not going to be a cathedral. There's going to be no chapel or any other house of worship. There won't be any place like that because as it says right here, verse 22, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. They are it. (laughs) They are it. Now I want you to think about this with me for just a moment. One of our problems as redeemed and rescued and saved and forgiven as we are in Christ, one of our problems is we tend to think of worship as a song or a service or at a place. And that would be inaccurate for us to be thinking like that. We tend, again, to think of worship as a song or a service or a a place that we attend and, and an event that we go through. But the picture here we get is that this is ultimately what God is after, and that is life is about worship. All of life is about worship. You won't need to be reminded through means that God gives us to help us remember and not forget his death, his burial, and his resurrection. You won't have to remember God is a holy God and a great God through symbols and means like that. There will be no temple there because the very one who will be there will be the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. They are the temple. They are the one present there. Life is meant to be. A life of worship. That's why Paul tells us, doesn't he, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, you do all to the what? Glory of God. That's that's a verse about worship. All of life is about worshiping God. Whether you eat or drink, the smallest seemingly mundane, routine thing that you do, you should be thinking in terms of, I want to remember the God that I belong to. 
And though we know this, this is where we greatly struggle to live it out and our hearts begin to love and worship the things that God has given us or we worship the things that God forbids us to have. That's what we start loving. And so there are temples in the Old Testament. There are tabernacles to remind the people of God, don't forget. There is communion. There is the Lord's Supper that reminds us in the New Testament. But when we get to this day, there's no more of that. Because all that those pointed to will no longer be needed because the one they pointed to will be right there in the midst. So I would say that when we think about Christ coming again and the new heavens and the new earth, what's going to be like? One of the things it's going to be like is going to be a life of nonstop and unhindered worship. Verse 23, here's what I see in verse 23. It's also going to be a life always in the stunning presence of God. A life in the stunning presence of God. Notice verse 23. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. Now, when you first read those verses, I know when I first read them, I thought and looked at it and I thought, wow, why isn't there going to be a sun or a moon? I mean, think back to this. Remember we've said that when the new heavens and the new earth are created, that there is continuity with the old earth and the old heaven. In other words, trees look like trees, birds are like birds. You know, uh, people still have arms and legs and eyes. They all look the same. Redeemed people have glorified, perfect bodies. The earth is perfect, but it's not like a disconnect from the old in the sense that it doesn't have any resemblance. There is continuity, but it's so redone and, and it is so restored back to God's glorious design that it's like a new heavens and a new earth. So if, watch this, in Genesis 1 and 2, God created the sun and the moon, right? And that was before sin entered in Genesis 3. He says to us in that text that it was very good. So when I read the verse, I go, this can't be right. I mean, why, why would God not have a sun and a moon? I mean, he made it. it, got, it, it it's all affected by the fall and the judgment on our world because of the sin of Adam and Eve. But it can't be that there's something wrong with it. And God just says, I don't want that in the new heavens and the new earth. Well, look at the text there. What it actually says, if you read it, and the city has, and here's the word you want to underline, no need. It has no need of the sun or the moon. Now, I personally believe that's because of the, the creation of the sun and the moon and all that goes with that with seasons and sunrises and sunsets, they're going to be all of that in the new heavens and the new earth. I think that we will have those. I think we'll have changes of seasons. We'll have everything that God intended, but it'll all be in the perfect way like it's never been since the fall in Genesis 3. But I think what he wants you to understand is this. Because of the one who is now present there, not a temple pointing you to or symbols and images to remind you of the glory of God. Now the glory of God is there because the person of God is there. The lamb is present there among his people. And there is such a blaze of God's glory and God's presence there. You don't need any sun and you don't need any moon. I would say outside there may be sun and moon throughout the created world and days and nights and all those things, but there is no need for it here. And I think that's why that word for is in there. The city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it for. Here's the reason. The glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the lamb. Now, here's a really neat little thing about the ones that's there. When it says here that the glory of God illumines it and the lamp is the lamb, we've got the Father and we've got the Son. In the Father, He is the very source of truth and life. That's how the Scripture presents Him. It all comes from Him. And so His glory is the one that is illuminating. But look what the Son does. The Son is the one who is like a lamp that reflects that glory. That's always been His role and His desire and His job as the Son. The Son is to be a reflector, a revealer, as it were, a radiator of this glorious God that He came into the world to make known. And so throughout all eternity, in this place, there is no temple. The Lord himself is present there. And there's no need for the sun or the moon because the glory of God fills and illumines that place. And his sun is like a lamp reflecting it throughout all eternity. Now, here's why I call this life in the stunning presence of God. <laughs> What's this, brothers and sisters? This is that same glory that at some points got revealed while Jesus was on earth. This is that same glory that on one occasion when Saul of Tarsus, before he became the Apostle Paul, was on his way on the road to Damascus. 
and a light shone upon him and it knocked him slap off of his horse. And he went blind and had to be led around. That is something of the reflecting of the glory of the Father that Saul encountered and it was a stunning moment, no less, for him to experience. And so this is a place where it is not only a life of non-stop and unhindered worship. There's no temple. There's no place we got to go to. It's always happening all the time. There's no service, no event to, to have this happen. It's just always the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are the temple. They are the ones there. They are the one present. There's no need for the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God illumines it, and the lamp is the Lamb. It is the all life and the stunning presence of God always. Here's a third one. And this is verses 24 to 27. And it wraps up the end of the chapter here. And I see this in the passage here as a reminder that, it, that this is also a life of total harmony and unity with brothers and sisters, with believers. Notice what he says here. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices the abomination and, a lying, and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, here's what I don't want you to think of. I don't want you to think of that there are some people in the city and there's some other people out here running around outside the city making their way to get there. That's not the picture at all. When you think of nations, what do you tend to think of here and now when we think about nations? We tend to think about conflict and war and separation. And what is man constantly trying to do? He is constantly trying to come up with treaties and ways to bring unity and harmony among the nations. And you know as well as I know because you know the Bible, that that's never, ever going to happen. In fact, Jesus said that as we approach the end, that nation will rise up against nation, and there will be wars, and there will be rumors of wars. We know that unity and that togetherness of nations is never going to happen by man's design and man's plans. But in the new heavens and the new earth, when the city of God, God's heaven comes to earth, as it were, what we're going to have is not only this place where there is this nonstop, unhindered worship, and this stunning, magnificent presence of God that will just do that, stun us constantly. But it's also going to be a place to where all nations, listen very carefully, will be together as brothers and sisters. You go, what are those nations? Are that just the nations of anybody? No, it's uniquely used in the book of Revelation of the redeemed. Remember in chapter 4 and chapter 5 when we studied back there, that he saw those who were gathered from every kindred, tongue, and tribe, and nation who had been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. This is another way of him describing here, I saw all of the people of God together, and there was truly unity and harmony for the very first time in their life. There was no war, no divisions, no separations. There's no barriers. There's nothing here that's keeping them apart. Unfortunately, in this world, when we think of nations and peoples and ethnic groups and colors and all of that, those things become the reasons why people tend to separate. Now listen to this. Trying to come up with dealing with ethnic issues, policies, cultural differences, economics, all that's never going to fix the problem because the problem is not any of those things. The problem is a sin issue. The sin issue is that sinners treat sinners horribly. And sinners want to separate themselves and not unite with people who are unlike them as far as color and politics and ethnic groups, cultural differences, etc., etc. But when we come to this day, in this new heaven and new earth, this eternal dwelling place of ours, it's not going to be a day where people will no longer be in harm, will be in disunity. There'll be harmony and unity as believers actually get along with each other. Where they literally know what it's like as nations of believers, those from every kindred, tongue, and tribe and nation, to be together as God's people. I think this is what Peter reminds us of, doesn't he, in 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10, that this is what we are. He says, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that we may declare the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. For now we are the people of God. So it is true we're to be living like that. We're to be modeling that. But the day will come where we won't be working on it anymore. It'll actually be reality. We will be in total harmony and unity with one another. If you look at verse 24, 
It says those nations, that is the, to me the believer from every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation, they'll walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Rather than thinking of life about me and my world and my wants, it's all about now the one who is present and his glory, that is God and his lamb for sure. Verse 25, in the daytime, for there will be no night, its gates will never be closed. And why is that? That would be unthinkable in any culture, wouldn't it? In a, in a, you go back in your times of Scripture and Bible, it'd be unthinkable to think that you could leave your gates of the city wide open all the time. But this is John's way, again, of reminding us here that this city will never have the threat of attack. It will never be in disunity. It will never be a time where there is not harmony and togetherness. Those doors will stay open all the time, as well as there is constant access to this God who lives in the midst of his people. That's, God, that's John's way of telling us that. Now, why is this place so secure? Why is this place a place where there is constant, unhindered worship and uh, stunning presence of God there? Why is, why is all this? Well, we could say that it is because God is on the throne and God is ruling, just as he promised at the very beginning of the book of Revelation that he was going to take it all back. It is his. He's going to gain it all, the, all the, the kingdoms of this world back and they're his, and that is true. But the reason that there is this total harmony and unity with believers in that city is found in verse 27. And nothing unclean and no one who practices an abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You want to know why in this place where there is unhindered worship and the stunning presence of God, everyone gets along because the people in it are the people who have been changed by the gospel. That's the reason. It's packed and it's filled with believers. As we've seen already in the book of Revelation over and over again, that God has sought to redeem a people for himself, his people. See, he didn't come to tell nations to get along with each other. He came to create a new nation, a nation called his, his own people. And so when he, when he talks here about verse 27, they're not that the city is secure, nothing is going to be of disunity and, and lack of harmony will take place. It is because the people in it are the redeemed people. And that's what he's reminding us of in verse 27. Nothing unclean and no one who practices an abomination and lying shall ever come into it. Why? They're, that's not for them. It's not their eternal home. It is ours. It's for those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So in this chapter here, we get a perspective of the new heavens and the new earth. So let's think of it like this, that it's a place that is totally restored from the fall. That's the one thing we've seen in the chapter. Number two, it radiates the glory of God through all of the jewels and all the glory that is described in those verses. And finally, in the last verses here, it's telling us that this city, this place will not need a temple because there'll be nonstop unhindered worship. You won't ever have to be reminded you need to worship God. And there will always be his stunning presence like glory. There won't be a need for a sun or a moon to light that place up because it's lit with the stunning glory of God. And all the saints will be there forever in fellowship as brothers and sisters. And they will get along in this world like they've never got along before. Let me sum it up with you by the way Steve Lawson describes it. He says, our perspectives will be perfected. Our consciences will be free from all guilt. Our appreciation for the atoning work of Christ will only grow throughout eternity. And we will forever enjoy living and serving with unrestricted freedom for the glory and pleasure of God as God originally designed and created us to live. He goes on to say, Heaven is known for what it does not include. No funeral homes, no hospitals or abortion clinics, no divorce courts, brothels or bankruptcy courts, no psychiatric wards or drug rehab centers, no pornography, child abuse, rape or missing children, no racial tension, prejudice or drive-by shootings, no misunderstandings, injustice or depression, no hurt feelings, emptiness or worry, no physical pain and no accidents, no heart monitors, no doctors, no nurses, no false teachers, no hurricanes, bad habits and bankruptcies. We will never need to confess sin ever again. We will not need to apologize again. We will not need to resist Satan again and we will never have to resist temptation. That's Life in the city. <laughs> That's life in the city. That's what I call it. <laughs> I want to go to that city. I want to be in that city. Now, you're looking at your watch and you're going, something's happening here. 
we're done too early. <laughs> I just wanted to rather quickly walk you through the text because it is Thanksgiving, and uh, I really believe that I need to help you think about the teaching that we should take home from this today. Okay? So, so don't put your paper away. Don't put your pen up yet. Just give me about five or ten minutes, okay? And we'll be done. So we took a tour of the city. We've seen what this city is like. It's a city we have never seen like anywhere. And it's a city we want to be in and we want to belong to. And so what it is, it's a city, uh, a place of worship. So what that teaches us and should remind us, secondly, is this. We are to be a people of worship. We should be a people of worship. And as I was thinking about that and thinking about Thanksgiving coming up this Thursday, I thought, Lord, you have got to help me to be able to tie Revelation 21 to Thanksgiving because it's somewhere in there. I know it is. And I need you to help me to do that. And it's really not hard to do that, brothers and sisters, as we approach this Thanksgiving season because Thanksgiving most clearly shows up in our worship of God. Thanksgiving most clearly shows up as we grow and develop more and more a worship of God. That day which we are headed for is a day of being in a place where it is unhindered, stunning worship and unity with each other before God always. So we should be being marked by that. Something should be be defining us and describing us in this world. And Thanksgiving in this season gives us an opportunity to think a little bit about what it means to be grateful and thankful and to be a worshiper of God. I mean, think about this. God has chosen until his son returns from heaven to do all that we just saw in Revelation 21. He has chosen to put you and me in the midst of a dark and perverse generation around us. That's what scripture says. And he has chosen in in that perverse and dark generation to let you and I shine like lights, it says. To be reflectors of this God that we belong to. And I think one of the defining marks that you find in the New Testament of a believer is that he is someone who is marked by gratitude and thankfulness and worship of God. Whereas the world is marked by ingratitude and and, and lack of thankfulness and complaining and murmuring about everything. Oh yes, it is true. We We can do that, but we learn rather quickly by the work of God's word and the spirit in our lives. That's not you. That's not what you're supposed to look like. That's not something you should be modeling. It's almost as if we read in the scripture that we are to be distinctly set apart in this attitude of gratitude that the world knows nothing about. I mean, I know the world may say, well, praise the Lord. They just kind of nebulously fire off a thank you up there like that, but they don't really mean anything by it. Our thank you and our gratitude should be something of a reflection of what it means to come into the presence of God and a little foretaste of what it's going to be when we get to what John just described in Revelation 21 where we enter into that place and we are in the continual stunning presence of God and this unhindered worship of Him and this sense in which we all know what we're living for and who we serve. That should be working more and more in our life here. So... Let me, let me have you turn to a passage of Scripture that I want us to turn to as we wrap up and we think a little bit about Thanksgiving. Uh, if you were with us on Wednesday night, you heard this passage. I'm going to quickly go through it. Uh, so just take it in as a second dose and a little more maybe to it. But let's turn to, to the Psalms. I read it this morning in the opening worship service. Let's turn to Psalm 100. And let's just quickly look at this Psalm and understand how this was written for the children of Israel to help them to help them really think in terms of coming into the presence of God and being thankful and grateful to him now again remember the temple in the old testament and the tabernacle is designed as a means to help them think ahead about what ultimately being in God's dwelling will be like forever and ever it's a foretaste of that So if you look at that psalm, Psalm 100, what I did not do this morning when I read the psalm is I didn't start where the psalm really starts. I read verse 1, shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. But the psalm actually begins in that little heading above there that says a psalm for thanksgiving. In other words, God's word actually to the Hebrew starts right there. That's as much inspired, that little phrase at the top, as the Ten Commandments or any other verse in the Bible. That phrase there says that God wants you to know before you look at this psalm that I'm giving you a song for Thanksgiving. It's going to show you what Thanksgiving should be like and why you should be thankful. 
And again, I want you to notice this. This is one of those psalms that's written in the Old Testament that is designed for the children of Israel as they came up to the temple to worship God. And particularly when they came to the temple to worship God with this song and this psalm, it was the time when they went to offer their peace offering. And it was a time where they were to fellowship with God and commune with God. And here's the picture I want you to get in your mind, if I can just kind of paint it for you real quickly. Remember that tabernacle and that tent there that we saw? There's a court on the outside. On the inside, there's a holy place. And then there's the holy of holies where God is. And you're coming to commune and fellowship with the place where God is at. And when you come to that tent or you came to that temple, there's only one door to get you in. And that one door is a reminder there's only one way to get to God. You can't come many ways. There's only one way, which Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So when you would come up to that Old Testament temple there and you walked into that place, the first thing you would feel was a lot of heat. Because there's a brazen altar sitting right there at the front of that door. And that brazen altar is where the sacrifice and the offering had been given in order for you to be forgiven. And your sins to be paid for. And so you come with your offering, whether it's a lamb or a goat or whatever it is that you're required to bring. You come and you bring this animal who has done nothing to really deserve to be killed. You're the one that's a sinner. It hasn't done anything. And you come and you put your hand on that animal and you confess your sin. You acknowledge you're wrong and you should be punished. But somebody else is going to take your place. And you bring that animal and you bring it to that brazen altar. And it is killed and it's sacrificed and it's totally consumed up in your place so that you can move closer to getting into the presence of God now watch this so in the peace offering (laughs) when you come as an Old Testament saint you're thinking about that song you're coming up to that temple and you walk up to the temple with a song of thanksgiving in your heart and you are thankful because you are realizing that the reason you can come to God is because somebody died in your place And so you would be met by one of the priests there. And the priest would say, as you bring your offering today, what is it that you are thankful to God for? That would be the challenging question at the temple or the tabernacle. What are you thankful to God for? What has the reminder of God putting someone in your place to take your judgment in your place? What has it done to cause you to be thankful to God? And so they would come and they would come up to that temple and there, these, these, th- these things would be on their heart and they would be on their mind. And they would be thinking about thankfulness to God. And then this is how it should show itself. If you really are really captured by the fact that someone just took your place at the temple, at that brazen altar, so you could be forgiven and you could have access and commune with God, there's some things that should happen in your life. Now listen, lest you miss the point, I don't see how you can, but if you do, that temple... And that tabernacle and that brazen altar and that animal being sacrificed is telling us that's exactly what Jesus did in our place. Jesus, the son of the living God, perfect, sinless lamb of God, comes down from heaven. God's son clothes himself in humanity with one goal in mind, and that is to go and die in our place and atone for our sins. And when you think about being a Christian, when you think about that great day when you're going to be in that city, in that place of unhindered, stunning worship in his presence, this psalm should remind you what it does to you even now as you're awaiting that day because that temple will be gone and then you'll literally be forever in his presence. It should do a couple of things. Watch what it says. Number one, it's, this is how we are to give thanks. It says, shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. In other words, you should be so affected by the very presence and the reality of what just took place for you to come into God's presence, that it creates in you this extreme shout to God. Now, he doesn't say recite thanks to God. He doesn't say say thanks to God. He says shout. Because a shout, as we learned the other night in Wednesday night Bible study, is a shout is an outward expression that is evidence of something affecting you. And this should affect you cross the gospel should affect us it's raising your voice as it were in triumph and celebration when you go to a ball game and you're watching a ball game maybe you're watching your team and your game yesterday when when you were affected by the triumph and the victory of that moment you probably went yes like that because it affected you this is ball (laughs) this this is an event you may go to this is the presence of god 
and the presence of God going into his presence through the sacrifice of one who took your place ought to surely affect you dramatically and cause you to have some form of outward expression of thanks. Here's what it says. We are to give thanks with a shout. Number two, we're to give thanks as we serve. Did you notice that? Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Not only do we actually think in terms of our lives here on this earth, waiting that great day as I want to be affected over and over again by remembering and reminding myself of what it took for me to get into the presence of God through that sacrifice so that it affects me in a way that is obvious and evident in my life. But I want everything I do, as the New Testament says, eat or drink whatever I do, I want to serve him with gladness. Not just serve him because somebody asked me to serve him. Not just serve him because the pastor will get onto you or a leader will come looking to you. Why are you not doing this? Why no, you need to serve with gladness because you're remembering whose presence you are in. We're to serve him with gladness. And we are, thirdly, it says, we are to sing joyfully. Come before him with joyful singing, shouting to the Lord joyfully serving him with gladness and coming before him with singing. You know, I just got to wonder if when you come to worship God and you hear the gospel sung, you hear the scripture read, if any of those things show up in your life. If that really happens in there, a shout of joy, serving with gladness. I'm so thankful to be able to serve him. Singing with joy. I wonder, really, honestly, as we come to this Thanksgiving season, is this God that we claim to know and we love and we, we've been re- redeemed by, does that affect us in any way like that? Or maybe you might be like the little boy who was with his mom at church one Sunday and he said to his mom, he said, Mom, what is the highest number you've ever counted to? And she said, I don't know. What's yours? He said, well, 5,372. She said, 5,372? Why did you stop there? He said, because church was over. (laughs) And that, unfortunately, is how some people come and go to church. How can we do that? How can we enter into his gates with anything less than a triumphant shout, service of gladness and singing with joy? How could we do that? It's because we forgot that we are a people of worship. We are headed to a place of worship, and we are a people of worship, and we so easily forget that. He ends up and says this. We do this because we know that the Lord himself is God. He is He who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. I think, brothers and sisters, as we contemplate right now, his loving kindness, his goodness, his faithfulness, you're going to be more prone to have gratitude and thankfulness and worship to God knowing that that's the kind of people we're called to be. You will do that. Let me wrap this up because we tend to think, well, you know, if things weren't going so bad, if I was in that place of worship that day, I'd be doing this. But we're called to reflect that and model that and, and demonstrate that even now. And I want to read something to you. I believe it will be a great blessing to us as we just end up our study here in Revelation 21 and thinking in light of that coming day in which we will have life in that city of unhindered, nonstop worship of God. It comes from a little devotional book. It's called Springs in the Valley. It's by uh, Mrs. Charles E. Cowan. You probably have read another book by her. It's called Streams in the Desert. Uh, What you may not know about her is that she was a, a wife of a missionary. She was a missionary. Her husband was a missionary. He became sick in the mission field, could not go back. They had to return to the States, and she cared for him for six years, and he finally died. And out of that sorrow and hardship of her life, she wrote The Springs in the Valley, a little booklet. And she tells a fictional story in the book of a man who found a barn where Satan kept his seeds ready to be sown in the human hearts. And here's the story. The man found that the seeds of discouragement were more numerous than any other seed. There were bags of them everywhere. When he asked around, he learned that it was because these seeds of discouragement would grow almost anywhere. When one of the demonic beings was questioned, he he reluctantly admitted that there was one place in which they could never get the seed to take root or thrive. And where is that? asked the man. The demon replied, in the heart of a grateful person. And that is so true. 
that we are a people of worship. We're headed to a place of worship. And one of the characteristics of our life in an ungrateful, unthankful, complaining world around us is that we ought to be marked out as the people of God who are people of worship, headed for a place of worship. It's not about a service. It's not about a song we sing. It's about a way of life. Thinking of every moment in the light of what Christ has done to save us and forgive us. And whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we're going to do all with the reminder and the conscious awareness in our hearts and minds, I want to please you with my life. So I wonder as you come to this Thanksgiving season, if you gather with your family, you gather with your friends, that you will have an opportunity to really shine like blazing fire glory in this dark world maybe a foretaste and a reflection of what really we're headed for in that day maybe till then we need to make up our mind like we're going to sing in just a moment that we are children of the promise that we live life in light of that promise and it affects us right now in this day let's pray